So good evening, everybody, and welcome to the February 8th meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. This open meeting of the Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. For this meeting, the redevelopment board is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating via video Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. So in order to confirm that all members of the redevelopment board are present, I'll take a roll call. Uh, Ken Lau? Here. David Watson? Here. Eugene Benson? Present. And myself, Rachel Zemberry, and present as well. The uh, two staff members that I've, oh, three that we have joining us this evening are uh, Jennifer Raitt. Here. Uh, Aaron Zorko. Here. And Kelly Linema. Here. Great. Do we have anyone else joining us this evening? J Jenny, I think it's just the three of you this evening. Just the three of us. Great. Wonderful. With that, we will. Uh, move to the first item in our agenda, which is a discussion about the MBTA community district and the proposed zoning amendment to comply with new requirements uh, as required uh, by the recent, um, recent measure that was, that was passed. And we started to speak about this during our last meeting. So Erin, I believe that you were going to take us through some of the analysis that the planning uh, department has started to look at. Yep. Um, so thank you, Rachel. Um, before going into the particulars of the proposal to address the MBTA community requirement, um, let me just uh, outline the timeline to date that well, we're working within. Um, so the economic development bond bill was signed into law by Governor Baker on the morning of January 15th. Included in the law is a requirement for MBTA communities, of which Arlington is one, to zone for multifamily housing by right with the following criteria. Be of a reasonable size, have a minimum gross density of 15 units per acre, be located not more than a half mile from a commuter rail station, subway station, ferry terminal, or bus station if applicable, have no age restrictions, and be suitable for families with children. I'll also note that the definition of multifamily in the law is three or more units. This requirement is effective uh, 90 days of the governor signing into law. And if an MBTA community does not comply with this requirement, it will not be eligible for funds from the Housing Choice Initiative, the Local Capitals Projects, or the Mass Works Infrastructure Program. So due to that impending um, effective date and the subsequent eligibility requirement, we presented this topic to the ARB on January 25th in order to include the submittal of a relevant war warrant article by the deadline of January 29th. The ARB agreed to submit a warrant article. Uh, subsequently on the afternoon of January 29th, we learned that the eligibility for these three grant programs would not be affected by the zoning requirement for the upcoming grant round. Um, over the coming weeks, we understand that the Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development will be working with MassDOT and with the MBTA and seeking feedback from the effective and affected MBTA communities to develop detailed guidelines on compliance criteria and timelines over the coming weeks. Um, so therefore there's two pathways for the ARB to consider tonight. The first would be to hold this particular warrant article to provide time to complete a planning study of the requirement once that detailed guidance is released by the state and bring forward an amendment at a special town meeting if one is to be scheduled in the future or the 2022 annual town meeting. Or we can pursue the, um, the amendment that was included with the, in the packet at this upcoming town meeting. Um, 
So Rachel, at this point, I can either pass it back to the board for consideration of these two pathways or provide um, the overview of my analysis and the work on the amendment provided in the packet. So I, I think you've done a lot of work um, already to, to look at this. And I think I would certainly um, appreciate at least, you know, foundationally hearing, you know, all, all of the work that you've put in to date, whether we choose to move forward at this time or, or um, move it to further study. Um, unless anyone on the, any other members of the board feel, feel differently, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to maybe hear the overview and then we can speak about which, which pathway we'd like to pursue. Sure. Can, can David, Jean, any, any other, any objections to that? I would I agree with you. That's fine. Great. Great. Thanks, Karen. Of course. Um, so in the packet and what's um, shown on the screen right now um, is a graphic that shows the half mile radius from Aylwick Station. There are a handful of business districts, B1, B2, B2A, and B4, the R2 district, the open space district, and the PUD are all located within this half mile from the station. At the January 25th meeting, there was discussion about establishing an overlay district to address the requirement. I also heard that changes affecting the R2 district were not desirable. I'll also note that the parcel zoned PUD that are located within the half mile are likely undevelopable due to the extensive wetland and floodplain resources that are present at that site. So the proposal that was included in the packet establishes an overlay district with its boundaries being the half mile radius from Alewife Station. It does not include any land that is zoned R2 or open space by the underlying district. So the amendment affects the parcel zoned PUD or business based on the underlying zoning. So for the specific density and dimensional requirements, I looked at the 13 parcels, business zoned parcels on the Western side of Mass Ave. These parcels range in size from 1,750 square feet to 14,375 square feet with the average size of about 5,060 square feet. The law requires a minimum gross density of 15 units per acre or based on the simple math of 43,560 square feet divided by 15, one unit per 2,904 square feet. For a building with three units, again, that's what's the baseline definition of multifamily in the law. Uh, for, so for a building with three units, um, the lot size would need to be at least 8,712 square feet. That's the 2904 times three. Only one of those business zone parcels meets that minimum lot size. So by reducing the minimum lot area per unit to 1,000 square feet, 11 of the 13 parcels could support at least three units while also accommodating parking, open space, and other ancillary requirements. I'll also note that um, the, uh, the question, one of the sort of unknowns at the time is what a reasonable size means. So by um, including, by reaching that threshold of 11 out of the 13 parcels, it would seem that that would be a reasonable size. Um, so now looking at the maximum height and the maximum stories, the proposed four stories and 40 feet is similar to what is allowed for mixed use buildings on less than 20,000 square feet in the B2, B2A and B4 districts now and to apartments on right of ways of more than 50 feet in the B2A and the B4 districts. The ARB might wanna look closely at the FAR, the floor area ratio, but at 2.0, the units could be family sized units meeting again, that criteria of the law. Uh, further analysis might show that this could be lowered a bit. We also looked at the off street parking requirements and reduced the number of spaces per unit required. This might, the proposal at 0.5 spaces per unit might be further than the ARB would want to go, but reducing this requirement in conjunction with this effort was also discussed at the January 25th meeting. 
And then finally, um, we developed language to tie in the requirement to comply with the inclusionary zoning. Um, so at this point, I think that's the high level overview that I wanted to give, um, hitting on some of the major points in the amendment. Um, and I'm happy to answer detailed questions from the board. Great, thank you so much, Erin. So I'll run through um, the, uh, our list here and ask for any questions for Erin or um, your thoughts. Well, let's do questions first and then we'll circle back through um, the, the group again about whether you'd prefer to hold this for future town meeting and um, ask for a study to be undertaken or, or move this forward in the timeline that we originally understood was required. So we'll start with Kim. Aaron, uh, I'm looking at this map you created, um, this color map. It's essentially the areas that are in pink or, or shades of pink and red. Is that the areas that, uh, are those are the 15 areas we're talking about? Yeah, exactly. Um, so the zoning map uses the pinks and the reds to denote business districts and um, the PUD has has the lovely polka dot yeah, on it. But yes, <laughs> the primary focus is the pink and red zoned parcels. Okay, so you feel strongly that if we got 11 out of the 15 units that it, that would suffice as far as um, their, their thoughts about meeting the, the criteria of having enough uh, area uh, for this um, rezoning. So again, the what a reasonable size is in the eyes of the Department of Housing and Community Development and the transportation agencies is unknown at this point. But based on my, you know, planning background and you know, my practice, I would say that that would achieve the requirement of a reasonable size. Um, I might have a different opinion than the agencies that are developing the guidance. All right. I'm just playing devil's advocate here. And I say, they, they say, no, nah, you don't have enough space here. Um, how do we proceed then? I think at, if, if what is being proposed here does not meet the requirements of that guidance that is to be released, I think we could look at um, including more land in the, um, in the overlay district. So that would be addressing the particular um, constraints that the R2 parcels might include, or it could be expanding the radius from the alewife station to go beyond the half mile radius um, from Alewife. Those would be relatively straightforward pathways should this zoning proceed to town meeting. Um, but uh, there could be other pathways if the ARB decides to hold on to this for the time being. Oh yeah, I, I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to figure out all the different options we, we may have. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and so All right, I think I'm, I, I'm, I'm kind of okay now for, for now, Rachel. I might want to Great. have a few questions later, but I'm just trying to get, get digest all this right now. Great, thanks, Ken. Gene? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Aaron, I think you did a really nice job with uh, the draft and with the explanation. I have a few wording suggestions, and if we end up deciding we want to go ahead, now I'll, I'll sort of raise them then, but we may not. Um, I guess my sort of one question is, if you look at the area along Mass Ave, in addition to the business districts, there are two or three lots that are R2. And I'm just wondering if you considered including the R2 lots that were on Mass Ave as part of um, the area that would be subject to the overlay district. So one question. Yep. Um, so uh, a couple of things. The, um, the R2 parcel that's between Lafayette and Fairmont Street, um, that, that's 
sort of squashed right in there as a single parcel, that's a historic structure. So I, I, that would have um, a number of other restrictions on it. And it's probably not worth including in here because of the historic nature of that structure. Mm -hmm. The other two buildings, um, the other two parcels that are right there, those potentially could be included, um, although it, it makes maybe the language a little bit trickier right. when it's a blanket right. um, prohibition to include the R2 that um, is just cleaner and more straightforward, but I'm sure we could figure out a way to include them. Um, I will note that uh, the many of the business zoned parcels with the exception of about three do have residential structures on them as do those two R2 parcels. Um, so there, there's not much other than the one that I had mentioned that has a historic structure on it. Um, the use on the ground is not very different than the business owned parcels. Great. I, um, I like too that um, um, you also authorized mixed use with at least three residential units in this. I thought that was an essential thing to do and I like that a lot. I also like that you tied it to the design guidelines also, which I think is, you know, the best substitute we can get to special permit environmental design review. So I did like all of those things also. Um, I guess the only thing I'll say now, and I'll say more later is, I understood the discussion about the R2 district going in the other direction which was maybe we should authorize three family dwellings in the R2 district. But um, for reasons I'll discuss later, I don't think we would wanna do that at this town meeting because I think we'd need more groundwork if we were to do that. And I think that if um, the um, guidance that eventually comes out of DHCD determines that what we have here is not a reasonable area, that's the other alternative to think about. But um, uh, Rachel, should we save the discussion about whether we want to? If you could, please, yeah. I just okay. love to make sure we have any questions to Erin okay. on the work that she's done to date. Okay. So that's Thank it you. for my questions. Great, David. Thank you, Aaron, for pulling all this together so quickly. Uh, it's it's very helpful to have it to, to look at, uh, given the extremely compressed time frame for this project. Um, so, um, I just going back to the to the map for a second. Um, are are the parcels uh, that are included? Um, on both sides of Mass Ave or, or only on one side? So I looked specifically at the parcels that are entirely within the half mile radius on the um, Western, or I guess that would be the Northwestern-ish side of Mass Ave. Um, the, two that are zoned B1 um, adjacent to Henderson Street. The one uh, right there, Jenny, the, that is a residential structure and then the lot next to it is vacant. Um, it appears that it's used for parking for the residential structure. The next parcel down in the B2A, that is CVS and Monogamy Grill and the hotel um, already developed um, lots not certain if there would be significant changes or this would have any bearing on the development there. Um, obviously those B2 parcels are, or B2A parcels are quite bigger than what I looked at, um, but I focused primarily on the Western side of um, Mass Ave. Okay. Um... You know, I, I was a little confused by the com, um, by the complete exclusion of of the R two district because I like Gene I, I thought that we we kind of we wanted to see what the possibilities were 
and uh, and I'm not talking about making the entire R2 district uh, part of the overlay necessarily, but um, I, I think it was something that ultimately, ultimately as part of this process, we we wanted to see what all of the all of the scenarios might look like. Um, but I, I think it really depends um, on the guidance we get. Um, so that's, uh, I, I, I think my feeling is the analysis is, is uh, as complete as it can be at the moment. Um, I, let's see, did I have any other questions? Um, I don't think so. Great, thanks, David. Um, see, I didn't have any questions other than those that have already been been broached. Um, specifically, I, I had one similar to, to David's question about what was in and, and out of scope in the review that you did. Um, so I think I'd like to open this up to the board and we'll go through um, in the same order to discuss whether this is something that we'd like to defer until we have further guidance um, on the parameters that need to be included um, and uh, include a more thorough uh, planning analysis or whether this is something that we do want to move forward um, as we had initially identified when we uh, initially thought that the timeline um, was, was different in order to be able to continue to apply for the grant cycle this, this summer. So I'll start with Ken. Uh, Rachel, I did. Please. I had I had one more question. I, I forgot. This was a process question. Sure. Um, so the the latest guidance uh, uh, from the state says that uh, these new requirements will not apply to to the current round of of grant funding. Um, that's correct. Uh, it, Rachel, if I might, that Please, uh, it is correct. Um, your compliance with the quote MBTA community requirement in the new law does not um, prohibit otherwise eligible communities from applying for housing choice, the local capital projects or mass works for the upcoming grant round. And, Presumably, and, we... and uh, I don't know, I know that uh, we, meet the eligible, I believe that we meet the eligibility for mass works, but I'm not 100% sure. There is um, a concurrent process relative to um, that, uh, that uh, the project that would presumably be applied for. Okay, and, and if we don't pursue a change now, um, when would the next round of grant funding happen that we might potentially want to participate in? I'm not sure. Perhaps um, Jenny can help me answer that question. Uh, I would presume next year, 2022. That would be in, uh, in all likelihood June of next year. Okay. That's okay. helpful. Thanks, Rachel. Great. Thanks, David. Uh, so I'll move it to uh, Ken to open the discussion about our thoughts on timing. Um, well, let me uh, start off with, I, I did forget, I apologize, Aaron, but uh, thank you for your hard work. This, this does look good. Um, my rush to ask questions, I forgot that. Thank you. This does look nice. Um, I do want to see if, uh, I, I would lean toward uh uh, waiting to see if we get more uh, clarification and not rush to get this uh, passed just because we, we don't know what all the parameters are. Uh, one of the things I do want to study, uh, and if we can do it, uh, can we do it? Another quick one like, like you just did is increase this radius from half mile to one mile Ooh. and also maybe, maybe uh, throw in one mile and three quarters miles and see how that's affecting Mass Ave. Because Part of me feels like, uh, and maybe it's just me, that the couple of, the couple of uh, uh, units we show here is not enough to make uh, 
make this compliant. I just don't, uh, you know, we're, we're talking here maybe a dozen units, maybe 10 units at most. I don't see that as, uh, as really increasing the, the um, addressing the housing demand that they're looking for. I think we have to increase that number by quite a bit. And I think um, I don't want to affect any of our two housing, but along Mass App, I, I, I'm very um, interested in, in uh, looking at. So if we if we just increase this up incremental, so maybe three quarters and one and one mile, uh, Aaron, and then just highlight the same way you did with some of the other buildings, and get an understanding of how what how's that's affected, and how how many more lots we can get. Yeah, that's that wouldn't be a problem. Could certainly um, you know, just, work you know, on that. And we can talk about it, but I, I would I would um, both defer. Great, thank you, Ken. Uh, Jean. Yeah, I too would um, prefer to defer until we get the final guidance on this because we don't know whether the um, way this is structured would meet the requirements for a zone of a reasonable size, first. Second is uh, building on Kin's comment, we're not sure whether you could do it with things that are outside the half mile radius because I think the law that got passed is pretty clear that the zone is within the half mile radius. So, you know, that I think is a question also. And third, if it doesn't meet it, and we do need to think about things like allowing three families within the R2 district within the radius, I think that requires more discussion, more analysis, and more community outreach. I'd say what was disappointing about the law that was passed is that just having this general half mile radius makes a lot of sense around a lot of commuter rail stations and sort of major commuter bus stations. It doesn't make all that much sense for places like Arlington, which are pretty built up that are you know within a half a mile of subway stations, but and there are a lot of other communities like Arlington in that regard, but clearly we're going to have to um, deal with it. So I'd be very interested in the guidance and um, would want to not move this forward now. Um, I guess the other thing I would say is if um, DHCD and MBTA are reaching out to communities for input in what the guidance would be, I'd like the uh, redevelopment board to be looped in to that also. That's it. Great, thank you, Jean. David? I would also uh, vote to defer on this uh, for all of the reasons that, that Jean just stated. Um, I think one aspect of this, which uh, I, I think the state definitely needs to think about is uh, in a situation like this, where uh, the MBTA station is located uh, basically at, at the edge of multiple communities, and uh, there's only a sliver of the half mile radius within our community, uh, that makes it dramatically more difficult potentially uh, for us to comply because there, there's just a lot less uh, area for us to consider. Uh, so I, I think that, uh, you know, in, in situations like this, and I, I would guess we're probably not the only community that has a situation like this, but, um, but it certainly, I, I think is affecting us significantly uh, due to the the location of the slice of Arlington that's within the half mile. Um, I, I also think, um, as Jean said, that um, since we don't know uh, what the 
the exact parameters are going to be or what the state will ultimately consider to be uh, reasonable. Um, anything we do now, um, whether it's further analysis or, um, uh, or, or actually moving this forward to town meeting would, would be uh, just taking a shot in the dark. And uh, I don't think that is, is the right way to approach this, particularly uh, where if we get into a situation um, where uh, we need to consider including um, some part of the R2 district in the overlay, uh, that is definitely going to require some careful um, thought and, and a lot of community outreach. So that's where I am on this. Great, thank you, David. Uh, and I concur with all of you that uh, in the absence of clear guidance from the state, it makes sense to rather than try to anticipate what could be, wait for that guidance um, and then further further study and determine the type of outreach uh, that, that will be required at that time. So, uh, are there any other comments or questions from the board before I move this uh, for public comment? Okay. Uh, just one, one more thing, Rachel. Please. Um, I always have one more thing tonight. Um, I, I just wanted to mention as, as I uh, uh, alluded to with my follow-up question to Aaron earlier, um, uh, with the additional guidance the state has provided on, on when this will go into effect with respect to the grant eligibility, uh, there really is no downside for us um, in, in deferring this from, from this year's town meeting. Great, thank you, David. So with that, I will uh, open this up for public comment. I will ask that you please use the raise hand function under the participant button if you wish to speak. Uh, please note that uh, you will be allotted three minutes for your comments. And I would ask that you please identify yourself by first and last name and address before you start your comments. Give me one second here. And the first speaker that we will have this evening will be James Fleming. Can you hear me? We can, thank you. Awesome, thank you. James Fleming, 58 Oxford Street. Um, one thing I was thinking about looking at the, the map that I'd seen, if I'm the state and I see this half mile overlay and I see that because of the weird way that our zoning is laid out, that you have this tiny sliver of Mass Ave and maybe the PUD counts toward this. My thinking is that they would probably say, that's not sufficient. You're using a quirk of your zoning rules to get around this requirement. Um, and the state law, it does seem pretty clear that you can't go beyond a half mile to count. And even if you could, you still only really get a, the sliver of Mass Ave that's, um, <clears throat> that's uh, that zone business. So you, there isn't really a lot of potential for development, which I can only assume that the state would require in this district without doing some sort of modification to, to, to the R2 district. I think a reasonable approach would be to start thinking about allowing three families by special permit and tying it to the design guidelines as a way to alleviate some concerns about going to increased density in that area. By my count, there are already about 10 three families in the area. So it's not something that's completely unheard of in that area. It is, it's, it's traditionally more urban, closer to LA, closer to more public transit. Um, I suspect the pushback that you would get would come from people who don't live in the area, uh, who just don't like, Ar who don't want Arlington to be any more dense than it already is. As far as parking goes, I, saw, I, liked, I liked that the parking requirements are lower in these districts at half space per unit. But given that this is literally the definition of transit oriented development, where you're close to LWF and other public transit, I don't see why requiring any parking at all as a requirement from the town is necessary. But you could probably just let the people who build on those lots 
decide for themselves how much they need given the location of the um, of the parcel in relative to public transit. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. The next uh, speaker will be. It's identified as P B W O R in the participant button or section. Oh, that's uh, that's Patricia Worden. Oh, great! Thank you. Uh, but, uh, she finally, and she's the computer savvy one. She. <laughs> I am uh, going to address you. This is John Worden, uh, Jason Street. <coughs> um, I, um, well, first, I, I, I find it hard to believe that the senator and representatives who purport to represent Arlington let this outrageous uh, provision affecting our town to go through. Uh, and, and maybe given enough time, they, they could get it fixed somehow. And this idea of that the, there's a law and then there's guidance. So it's, again, it becomes a rule of not of, not of laws, but of men, that are going to, of men and women, probably, who are gonna decide uh, what, what, what the law means and how it suits their, their perceptions, not ours. Uh, the, uh, if, if uh, you know, places like say Dedham or Swampscott were built to the same density that we already have in Arlington, we wouldn't have this so-called Shortage of housing, so the re really that the, 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 they should fix their own their own towns before they they start messing with ours. I do agree with the redevelopment board uh, that that there is no rush. Uh, we, we we've got a lot of things to find out before we go forward on this, uh, and and we should certainly take the time. This is a very important and potentially a devastating uh, blow to our community. And, and there's no need to, to, to fly into it. And the, the proposals that have been, been made uh, are so uh, un-Arlington-like and, and inappropriate that I, I can't believe town meeting is gonna go for those. Uh, I really think that, uh, uh, so we, we, we've got to, <coughs> we, <coughs> I, 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 I would ask the board, uh, in their further deliberations and consideration of this topic to ask their staff and the planning department to come up with the minimal, minimum uh, number of things that could be done to satisfy what we know about this awful law at the present time. Not, not, not this thing of these high buildings with no, no front yards, no backyards, no parking, no this, no that. That's, that's not the kind of Arlington that, that, that we know. And I, I point out that uh, that that you, you, you members of the board, uh, you know, you 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 represent the people of Arlington, not the governor, not Chapa, not developers, not MAPC. Uh, you you have to consider what is best for the people of Arlington, and and to and to inflict anything similar to what's been proposed by the planning department at this point would would be outrageous and I, I I hope you won't do it and won't try to persuade the town meeting to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, the next speaker will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. The new state mandate requires that we allow three family houses to be built by right somewhere in the district. I looked at our bylaws and I found that three family houses are already allowed in all of our business districts by special permit from this board. And the dimensional requirements allow us to build a density of up to 17 units per acre. All that we need to do is tweak the table of uses to read three families by right instead of by special permit. That's it. There's nothing in this new law that suggests we need or should eliminate front yard setbacks, side yard setbacks, and usable open space. Rather, the law states clearly that this new housing must be suitable for families with children. How does the elimination of all yards of any patch of green where children can play make it suitable for families? What is family, fr family friendly about a neighborhood where every square foot of ground is either built up or paved over, where there isn't even enough space for a tree that casts real shade. These tacked on dimensional changes make any housing distinctly family unfriendly. 
and they will decimate the small businesses of this neighborhood. The lunacy of all this is that we have already met the state's density goal. We are already well above the target of 15 units per acre. We have done it with a neighborhood of two family houses on very small lots. By what logic does the state say that this is not good enough and we should adopt a cookie cutter approach, which is more appropriate for other communities? Um, I agree with those board members who say, we're not ready for this yet. Let's defer it and try to make sense out of what is really a, a very stupid mandate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. Uh, the next speaker will be Steve Revelak. Good evening, Madam Chair, Steve Revelak, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. Um, I also am in favor of deferring this decision or deferring this article until the next town meeting or next special town meeting, um, because it sounds like we would be able to do so without penalty. Um, it would really be nice, I think, to wait until DHCD issues their guidelines for compliance so that we you know, have, a, have a clear picture of what's going to be required for us. Now, in the event that you know, some of the, there are changes, we would need to make changes within this R2 district. I suggest perhaps reaching out to town meeting members whose precincts are in this half mile radius and trying to set up some community meetings. Um, I mean, the R2 districts in East Arlington already have a number of triple deckers, and it's quite possible that you know folks there would not be averse to having, you know, to having a few more. Um, but basically, the idea, the general, you know, my, what I'm generally saying is that it would be nice to do some precinct meetings and get some community input if you know that area is going to be affected. Um, although it sounds like the current draft language isn't going to go, may not go forward, uh, I would like to make two substantive comments on it regardless. Um, first, I commend Ms. Worko for the job that she's done, but um, in section 5104B, um, I think the paragraph is referring to minimum lot area per dwelling unit. And if that's correct, um, I'd suggest changing the term development intensity to minimum lot area per unit, uh, because the latter is a term that we use in our dimensional tables. And uh, regarding the map of the overlay itself, I think there would be benefit to clarifying what happens when the radius bisects a parcel. I mean, it sounds like the intent is to, have, to include parcels that lie completely within the half mile radius, but it would be, I think beneficial to spell it out so there's uh, no uncertainty about that. Um, so that's all I have and uh, thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Mr. Revelak. The next speaker, uh, it's identified as, I believe it's uh, Ganit's uh, iPhone. Oh, you're on mute. Hi, thank you so much for allowing me to speak and thank you for all the great work that has been done. Can you hear me? I can, yes. If you could just identify yourself by first, last name and address. Thank you. I'm Cohen. I, I live in 43 Brown Street in Arlington and I'm also a town member of Precinct 19. Um, I wanted to raise a question whether this will be included in the updated report. What will be the uh, financial impact to the town, not just to the specific um, districts, precincts that are affected by this, but assuming the population will increase in that half mile use, half um, mile radius, we will probably will need to increase classes, right, to build more classes in the school, hire more staff. So there will be an added cost to the town and whether the state will chip in into that added cost or would that come from the entire town? Um, budget. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, Aaron, I will throw that one over to you to see if that's something the uh, financial impact is something that could be included potentially in a uh, future planning study. We could certainly work with the um, finance department in town hall to look at what the cost would be. 
And just to add one point, if that's the case, I think this, the speaker who spoke before me about having some meetings with affected precincts, I think meetings should be around the town because all the town will be affected by this new rule. Great, thank you. Did you have any other? No, items? thank you. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Okay, the next speaker will be uh, Laura Liebensberger. Hi, I hope you can hear me. We can, um, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I just, I'm just a person. I'm, who I'm sorry, there. could you just identify first, last name <laughs> and address? My name is Laura Leibensberger. I live on Thorndike Street. Um, I've been here for 20 something years. I'm just a normal person. <laughs> I'm not part of any uh, town meeting or anything. Um, and I was just reading about these things online so I don't know everything about it. But I am going to say it seems like East Arlington is getting walloped with the weight of development. And I just want to say we're already the most developed area. We don't have a lot of other space. I, I just kind of feel like we're being sacrificed for the rest of the town. Nobody, you know, no other areas are stepping up and saying, we'll take this development because it's wonderful. Um, so, I mean, I'm just saying, I've been reading about this and I'm not really happy about it. So, so I want to say, I feel like somehow East Arlington is going to bear the brunt um, and we're like already the most developed area without nobody here has big lots. You know, there are no big open spaces. The same, there's not a lot here to develop into. So I'm, I know what the state mandate is, but I'm just saying maybe the state mandate isn't the best thing, given that this is already a highly developed area, and I don't know if we have anywhere to go. So that's all I'm saying. I don't think we really have anywhere to go in terms of building. I think other areas of Arlington could take this on more easily. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for sharing uh, sharing that. Um, I, just, I just will point out that unfortunately due, due to the state mandate, and again, we'll find out a lot more information hopefully when they um, provide additional guidance, um, we, we don't have another area they're very specific about the the radius that we do need to to look at but i definitely hear your hear your points the next speaker will be carl wagner hi madam chair can you hear me okay yes we can thank you thank you very much for taking my comments um, i applaud the uh, board for what sounds like maybe a decision to put this off till we know more and um, for any members of the public who showed up, I, I wanted to point out that I think this is a laudable goal of the government of Massachusetts, the idea that there should be 15 units per acre of density at the end of transit uh, sites like the Alewife station. At the same time, I wanna applaud the poor people who live in that part of Arlington and all over Arlington because that part of Arlington is already over 15 units per acre. The sad thing about this law, and I hope everybody listening will write to Representative Garbley and Senator Friedman about this. The sad thing about the law is that the fact that there are two families doesn't count. They have to have 15 units per acre in more than two families. And that's just unfair because the whole purpose of the law was to get Arlington to to be the model for all the other terminuses. And we, we're doing well. This is why we moved here. This is why we stay living here. So I really encourage people to say, wait a minute, this is the model and the others should come up to our level, not we should be forced to demolish our, our successful area and build expensive luxury condos for God knows who. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Uh, the next speaker uh, is just identified as Chris. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think that's me, Chris Loretti, 56 Adam Street. Great, thank you. Um, thanks. I I also support the board deferring action on this until a later date and, and until it gets more guidance from the state. Um, and also to Mr. Um, um, Seltzer's point, I also read this primarily as a desire to allow by right development. And so I was surprised to see that the board or staff was proposing so many changes to the dimensional requirements 
since the town already allows the desired density um, <clears throat> by special permit. And all you really need to do is change special permit uses to, um, to by right uses and you can take care of it. Um, I'm very concerned about having no side yard setbacks and 40 foot high walls on those lots that abut these, these um, the lots that would be buildable under this proposal. And I would ask you if you lived in one of those R2 zoned homes or even in your own home, how you would like having a 40 foot wall built right on the property line next to your house. <clears throat> the other issue I wanna raise is the inclusion of mixed use in this proposal. And the problem I have with this is now mixed use becomes right. And you combine that with your board's interpretation of the mixed use zoning bylaw that says you can put any use in a mixed use. And now you have any use going in by right into one of these developments. Just put three housing units and you're all set. So if I were employed by say McDonald's or other some fast food restaurant, I would think this is just swell. And I would be happy to explain to them how they could get one of them in there by right when in past and long past, they couldn't do it at all by special permit or otherwise. So I'll leave it at that, but I really think this does need um, some more thinking uh, as you move forward. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I'll just take a minute um, to address uh, one, I think, misconception that I, I, I want to clear up. The uh, report that was prepared by the planning uh, department, as well as the studies, were requested by the uh, redevelopment board um, in terms of the, the scope and breadth of, of what they looked at so that we could begin to look at all of the different um, potential ways that we could push and pull to, to meet this requirement. Um, so uh, again, thank you to the planning board, but I, I do wanna be clear that it was a study that was done um, by the request of the redevelopment board, not of um, their own volition. So uh, the next speaker, I believe, uh, do we have anyone who has not spoken uh, yet who would wish to speak? I have two people who are, are looking to speak again. Okay, seeing none, we'll go to James Fleming. Yes, I had uh, just a sort of a question about what else might be in scope. I was looking at the text of the law. It wasn't clear to me if uh, bus stops, say for example, along Mass Ave or Broadway were in scope for this law. Um, do you have given to know if that's the case? Uh, Aaron or Jenny, I'll defer to you as I know that you've looked at uh, the, the scope and, and which, which uh, transit nodes are included. Uh, thanks, Rachel. So as we understand it, um, the law uses the phrase bus station. Um, I think that or both Jenny and I believe that had they intended to include bus stops, like the bus stops that are up and down Mass Ave and on other streets in Arlington, um, they would have, the writers of the law would have used the word bus stop rather than a bus station. Um, we also don't believe that it is applicable to the bus uh, lay, layover space in Arlington Heights, the, um, what is sometimes referred to as the bus barn, um, as that is a turnaround um, primarily for buses and does not operate at the same level as uh, bus stations like large terminuses where multiple lines um, connect with other rapid transit services. But I would assume that in the guidance, this would be, you know, uh, made more clear. Makes sense. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next person on our list is Patricia Warden. Thank you, Hello, Madam Chair. Uh, Patricia, I have one other speaker. While you are working on your technical I issue, can't. I will. Um, oh, are you? I think I oh, have you have it resolved. Fantastic. Go ahead, please. I actually uh, just turn out the camera, please.
Let me get back to your meeting. Hello, I have the other computer turned off, I think. I'm trying to turn it off. Um, can you hear me? Um, we can. It sounds much better. Please go ahead. All right. Um, actually, I, this is my first time speaking. Last time, I set myself up in another computer thinking you would surely recognize me as a first time speaker, but that's why the interference occurred okay. because I had a second computer going. Um, I just want to say that as a former school committee member and chair, I am extremely concerned about the, 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 the um, lack of interest shown by your, the, um, your staff in the um, very, very constrained situation as far as the school population for that, that area in the Hardy School and the Thompson School are extremely, um, uh, are extremely poor and crowded. And I cannot believe that you're even considering um, increasing, uh, enabling increased population density, maybe drastic, um, that without consulting the school committee and as a, one of the participants earlier said, the financial situation, which has been um, which has been really promoted by Alan Tosti, former chair of the Finance Committee, that we cannot endure any significant increase in school costs. And I, I think that you have to keep in mind that our children's education is probably the most important thing of all in this town. And as Mr. Seltzer said, the, the, the um, ability of children to be provided for with a little bit of open space is also a very high priority. And this whole situation really needs to be brought to the attention by you, to the attention of our legislators. It's been totally inappropriate for Arlington. And thank you for deciding to postpone your decisions on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair, for indulging me a second time. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, I have a question about the half mile distance criteria. Um, clearly the intention of this uh, law is that people within walking distance of the T station, uh, it doesn't make sense to interpret it at, as half a mile by as the crow flies. Uh, people can't get from Mass Avenue to our wife walking in half a mile. It comes far shorter than that. Uh, I just ask that you give consideration and maybe ask for further clarification uh, from the state as to whether the real intention here is to only include that district within a half a mile of walking distance from the T station. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, the next speaker uh, is Colleen Cunningham. Hi, it's actually Stuart Boris and Colleen's um, uh, husband were on Kensington Park. I just have a question and that is that, so I understand that the, um, the, the requirement is to you know, make these zoning changes and if the town doesn't make them, then the town is not eligible to receive uh, certain grants or certain sources of funding that you mentioned, and I have forgotten what they are. My question is, do we use any of that funding? Uh, the short answer is, is yes. <laughs> I can uh, defer to, uh, to Jenny. We spoke a little bit about, about that uh, during the, the last meeting, but uh, Jenny, perhaps you could provide an um, overview of specifically the um, MassWorks funding, how that is intended to be used by the town. Sure, thank you, Rachel. Um, so there's three types of funding that are connected to this requirement. The first one is MassWorks, which is a grant program that is essentially a, an amalgamation of multiple infrastructure, public infrastructure grants that help to advance housing and economic development activities across the state. And it used to be a number of different types of grant funding programs. Actually, Arlington had accessed the Community Development Action Grant uh, way back in the day uh, to improve Arlington Center. And uh, most recently, we've turned our attention to utilizing MassWorks to potentially address the uh, very dangerous and um, 
challenging intersection at Mass Ave and Appleton, as well as the surrounding area there, particularly due to the fact that it will cost the town likely a lot of money to um, address the number of issues that are there. So that funding um, is a resource to the town that would offset the costs that the town would have to uh, bear otherwise. So that's, that's one of the programs, MassWorks. Um, the other ones are Housing Choice, um, which are basically uh, grant pro both uh, grant programs for planning and then for capital funding towards affordable housing programs. If you are an eligible housing choice community, which we are not, by the way, due to the fact that we, um, part one, do not have an, a high, high enough rate of development and also that we uh, do not meet the uh, lowest level of criteria for activities to advance housing affordability in the community. Um, if we were to meet those two uh, minimum threshold requirements, then we would be eligible for both the planning activities uh, granted to communities for housing choice, as well as the capital funding for affordable housing projects. Um, so I think that that's the three programs. Erin, is there anything else to it? I don't believe so. Okay. okay so thank you. Let me, thank I'll you. just say one word and then I will sign out. So it sounds to me, well, so yeah, it sounds to me like a lot of the money that's on the table is there for development <laughs> in any event. And so if we don't develop, then we don't get money for development. So it sounds, with the exception of, you know, the really a, a nice project that you mentioned up there on Appleton Street, it sounds like um, it's not money that we actually need. Um, and then the question becomes, you know, the money, the project on Appleton Street, what's the cost of that offset against the cost of, as Mrs. Warden points out, all the kids in school we're going to have to pay for all of the street repairs that are going to come from you know increased population and so on so let me respectfully ask the uh, board and i guess eventually the town meeting members to consider you know dual cost benefit analysis on this thing do we really need to do this development in order to get these um, funding sources or are they uh, funding sources we don't actually need and we'd be better off without them thank you thank you uh, I'll, I'll just identify that um, in, in response to that last piece, the intersection at Appleton and the need to be able to apply for those funds, um, I, I think goes beyond a cost benefit analysis. It's a, it's a public safety issue. And, I, and I, I think that we've heard from many people how important it is uh, for the town to um, to make a positive impact at that intersection, which, which is going to take a significant amount of funding. And the town has identified that this particular grant program um, is, is a very important, uh, very important part of, of their being able to address that. Jenny, I don't know if you have anything else that you wanted to speak to on that. No, I think that summarizes it. Great. Jenny or Aaron, did you have any other um, any other responses to any of the questions or, or feedback that that came up during the, the public comment area before we just move it back to the board for any final thoughts? Uh, Rachel, if I might, um, I would like to address the simple change of going, of allowing three families in the business district versus by special permit, that of which they're allowed right now. Three families in the business districts, including all of the business districts that are within that half mile from Alewife uh, require a minimum lot area of 6,000 square feet, plus a minimum lot area per unit of 2,500 square feet. So um, you can meet the requirement by taking a basically a, um, 700, uh, sorry, 7,500 square foot lot, but, and um, you know, you could allow three family, a uh, three family on that uh, parcel. However, within the scope of business zoned parcels that are within that half mile radius, only one lot at that is 14,375 square feet would actually be able to accommodate the required minimum lot size. The other ones are as low as 1750 square feet. Um, and then there are a number that are at about 5,600. So that is, would probably be the simplest change that we could envision, but by the nature of the size of the lots, 
it may not play out in reality on the ground. Great, thank you for that clarification, Erin. So I'll ask, I'll go through again um, the, the list of, of board members to see if there are any final thoughts or, or questions. Um, there's no action we need to, to take tonight. Obviously this will, the, the warrant has already been filed and this will come up again uh, during the hearing, um, but it appears that we're all in alignment to uh, defer uh, any action on, on this um, as, of, as of at least this meeting um, for, for this coming town meeting. Uh, Ken, did you have any other additional thoughts? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, no, I just wouldn't mind having more continuing uh, meetings on this. And, and I think Steve had a good idea about uh, meeting with some of the people in, in the affected area. Uh, and a little outreach there. And uh, I just like to also see if um, what that three quarter mile and one mile radius would look like. Great, thank you, Ken. Gene? Thank you. Um, I'll just add a couple of things. You know, I grew up in a triple decker until I was 13 years old. And the first house I lived in in Massachusetts for a few years was a triple decker three family. There's nothing wrong with them. Kids can grow up in them. They, you know, they have fine lives. I'm not saying we will end up with a zone that allows three family homes where there are now two within the radius. But if we do, I would say it is not going to make a major change to that community. Kids are going to be a few blocks from those parks. That's what I did when I grew up learned how to use my bicycle to get to and from. So I think this perception that somehow allowing more three family homes is somehow going to ruin children or ruin Arlington is just wrong. The other thing I'll mention is that those areas are pretty well developed and it's not like there are lots of open lots where people will then build three family houses instead of two. You know, probably there will be a few built over the years, but it's not going to have a major influx of uh, students to the school system. So, I, you know, that those are just my um, perceptions. And I would just ask people to consider that when they're, if we come back and take a look at this. Thank you, Jane. All good points. David? Uh, I have no further comments. Great, thank you. So we will uh, close discussion on, on this topic. Um, we'll uh, ask that Aaron and Jenny keep us updated as we hopefully hear additional uh, guidelines and requirements from the state. Great, thank you. So we'll move on to agenda item number two, which is an update on redevelopment board properties. Jenny, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Rachel. And before we do that, I just want to sincerely thank Aaron and also Kelly um, Lanima. Kelly and Aaron worked on the maps and, um, and also the text that was presented this evening. No, Kelly didn't get to, a chance to speak, but I certainly want to acknowledge her effort um, in helping to prepare for this evening, both of them, of course. So thank you to both of you for helping with the conversation. It helps to have a map and the visuals and something to actually respond to. And when we first talked with the board about this at the prior meeting, of course we were work, we were operating um, as quickly as possible just to insert it so that in the event that we needed to comply in order to apply for significant funding, um, you know, we were we were going to do that. And we, I think, uh, honored the board's request in terms of moving forward and preparing something and providing us with an additional week of time, which is why the meeting is this evening and not last Monday night, in order to do that so that we could have a real conversation about it. Um, I realize it obviously has elicited a, a lot of response and reaction and um, we of course understand that and this is not a typical situation that we find ourselves in. And we talked about that when it came up, the evening when it first came up. Um, so I appreciate the board's 
comments this evening and also the path that you've chosen to go down to allow for more time for us uh, comfortably to understand what's going on and also hopefully to provide feedback during a regulatory process that typically provides any lawmaking process. Um, so I, I look forward to that conversation continuing, but I just again want to thank Aaron and Kelly for their effort in a very short time frame in the middle of the other things that they're also working on. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to pivot to the redevelopment board properties and just um, we actually have a couple of neighbors, I think, still, maybe. Now I'm not seeing them. Yeah, I think um, Shell is here and Max are also here, our direct neighbors to 23 Maple Street. Um, so 23 Maple Street, as you might recall, last year we had a tenant who left um, and they left as of basically uh, around the middle of July. Um, so the property became vacant. We put out an art uh, request for proposals through the town's uh, typical process, received no responses. Um, I put out a second request for proposals and began a conversation with folks in the arts community um, about potentially looking at the property and looking at some opportunities. Um, and I actually extended the RFP response deadline with hopes that something would gel and come together. Unfortunately, um, the property is really not well suited to that use for artists, um, despite many, many of them looking at the property. I held many tours. I also spoke with uh, many uh, arts administrators and consultants. I spoke with the Arlington Center for the Arts, who is a tenant at the Central School, I, um, and also other arts organizations in the community. And unfortunately, that's that does not appear to be the right avenue to go down right now. Um, it's, it requires capital and it requires um, a, a structure that allows for one, we need to have a, a, a lease with one tenant, not with multiple tenants. Um, so it was hard for that to come together, unfortunately, and so we, we had to abandon it. Um, I put the RFP out again and also received no response. Um, and I think part of the reason is that it's it's basically a single family home that had been used for school administrative functions for a long time after it had been a single family home um, until the town uh, basically turned the property over to the redevelopment board. And soon thereafter, the tenant that had been at the property up until last summer was in that was at that property operating a group home which is of course a residential use. So essentially that residential use seems to fit in. Um, unfortunately that, you know, the use um, that was going on there, we wanted to pivot and change and look into other possibilities, particularly offices. So I had been investigating that market, but due to the fact that a lot of upgrades would be needed in order to accommodate offices and that it's actually a quite sizable property to rent, it's about 5,400, square feet of rentable space, um, I couldn't get any interest. Um, also, we, our prior tenant had been paying about um, somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of $56,000 a year, including all of the capital costs, by the way. They, main, they basically maintained the interior of the property. So it was a very, it was a quite a sizable, decent situation, a decent agreement uh, to be in at that time for, for quite a long time and one that benefited the Urban Renewal Fund, which is basically the fund that supports that property, the Central School property, and the Jefferson Cutter House, which is part of the overall, when I say portfolio, <laughs> those are the three properties that I'm talking about. Um, so without that tenant, it's hard to figure out how to fill that blank. And we're almost into you know, a pretty long time without any, any rent at all, by the way. So. Um, with, as you're familiar with, the DPW building, um, and frankly, that whole campus is being renovated in the coming, you know, 18 to 24 months, essentially. Um, and obviously, they have a need for office space. I had previously looked at the building with other town offices that are being uh, displaced by the high school renovation. Unfortunately, it was just not an appropriate space for the IT department, for example. Um, or the facilities department. And so we then started talking with the DPW um, staff and basically their engineering division 
as well as the inspectional services department are in need of space, which includes customer facing space, um, because obviously people come in typically not not currently, um, but typically, obviously, a lot of people go there for applications and appointments, um, particularly the inspectional services department. But none of the other functions through the DPW would be would be housed um, at 23 Maple Street. So we were really just, you know, looking at the space for those two entities. They are very interested in being housed there during the time that the DPW campus is being renovated. Um, they can pay a modest amount monthly, um, certainly wouldn't fill that big hole, but it would be something to continue to support the fund and the general you know, basic operation of the building, um, but not any repairs, which is what we've also used the fund for. Um, and so uh, essentially there's, uh, just to keep at this for a little bit longer, the, there are six parking spaces that go with this particular building. Those spaces we think would include maybe a couple of spaces that would be very short term for visitors who you know, are coming and going specifically for the purpose that I just mentioned um, when visiting inspectional services. And then four spaces that would probably be reserved for some, some of the employees. Um, everything else though, just like with any other town office that operates at either frankly town hall um, or at uh, the central school building where we have a lot of town offices, they would have to figure out where else to park. There's not actually any staff parking provided. Um, you know, there are some spaces that are designated staff spots as you've likely seen, um, but the, for the most part, people park along Academy or Maple, sometimes in the town um, municipal lots and then also behind the Masonic building. Um, that's generally what, what happens with town, uh, town staff cars, uh, people who drive. Um, so with all this said, I'm looking for your, um, to understand if you have any you know, comments or concerns. I know that the two neighbors are here and they've, they've also expressed by email their concerns to me about uh, you know, particularly idling trucks, um, what's gonna happen with the, you know, the coming and going of visitors. And um, you know, we, we did talk a little bit about that by email, but I wanna make sure that the board is uh, would be comfortable with this arrangement for this time period while the DPW renovation is happening. And then also with a look ahead to maybe thinking about what to do with this property in the long term. Um, I have thoughts about that and I, I don't think that now is the time to talk about what to do with the property if it's two years away, but we will need to definitely have a, a deeper conversation about this at a future date. But in the meantime, we have a vacant building that is under our purview. And we have a need uh, by town staff during a renovation to have spaces for their offices. So I would like to proceed with having a this lease agreement with the DPW and the Inspectional Services Department to provide that um, option for them for this temporary time. Great, thank so, you, Jenny. Thanks. Uh, so I'll run through the, the board members uh, for any any comments or questions, starting with Jean. What is the temporary time? How long would the lease term? Well, I think we heard from Mike Rademacher and the architect that it's like an 18 to 24 month timeline. That's the best I have. I, I mean, I have their I have their projected schedule, but they it's you know, they they don't have a contractor, they don't have, you know, they don't have a construction schedule yet. So I think we'll have to be a little bit flexible from my perspective. I mean, I, I'm giving you the 18 to 24 month timeline because that's what they've been communicating both to both basically town meeting as well as to the redevelopment board. We actually will be having a hearing on the property. I'm gonna forget the date, March, no. Uh, oh, the DPW property. The um, property. February 22nd. The 22nd, the next meeting. So I think we'll, I'm sure we'll hear again about the, their projected timeline, but again, it is projected until they have a, you know, a contractor and all that stuff. So. Yeah, I mean, my sort of initial take on it, it seems like a good short-term solution for inspection services and what it, what it was the other department you said would be. Engineering. It's a division within DPW. Yeah, I think. One of one of my questions, I'm, I'm, I know the building from the front. I don't know the building from 
the side or the back. Is there a handicapped accessible entrance to the building? Yeah, there is. Um, there's actually a ramp that goes into the back. That's okay. actually where we would have the public facing, like a counter, essentially. We, we would need to do some work, but there's like, it used to be a garage and then it was converted into like a room. And uh, we would just have to do a little bit of retrofitting. There's actually an accessible restroom there as well when you first come in. Um, yeah, so great. yeah, I do need to work on the parking um, piece though. So we, we've talked about that. We would uh, assign uh, a couple of um, accessible parking spaces as well. Is there a need for more bicycle parking? I mean, does it make sense to put a bicycle rack there? Um, there's not really a space for it in that driveway proper and I'd prop, I would, it's in the historic district. So I, any change that I make to the exterior, I have to approve, have them approve anyway. But maybe across the parking lot. I, I just across, wanted... the, across the parking lot is actually more parking. <laughs> Um, it's basically all parking. Right, I know. I just wondered. I just wondered if it would benefit from some bicycle parking. So yeah. I'm not saying it's necessary, but I think it's worth looking at. Um, I know. I I totally agree with you. The bicycle parking in that vicinity is at the central school, around the um, mm -hmm. the driveway. Yeah, and I guess the only other thing is you mentioned idling vehicles. I don't know if that's a problem, but clearly the town should be, if it's not, you know, making it pretty clear to the employees that, you know, there's a five minute rule on uh, idling in the town. So um, that shouldn't be happening, but yeah. Yeah, I think this is a good short term solution. And I hope maybe halfway through the lease term, if not sooner, you know, the board and you can have a discussion about what next for the building? <laughs> Great, thank you, Jean. Ken? Uh, yeah, I, I do agree with Jean. I think it's a good fit uh, uh, for this space here. Um, I'm just, the only question I have is how much renovation are they requiring uh, to, to suit, their, uh, suit their, their needs? I mean, Very minimal. It's, okay. it's minimal. Yeah, we, um, we did a, an ADA self-evaluation and transition plan update last year, which uh, showed us that about, um, you know, a certain level of updates would be needed to make it into public offices. Um, so we'll, we'll have to pay for those updates, but it's basically, you know, min there's not, I wouldn't consider it to be renovations. It's really, it's like signage, uh, dealing with thresholds, uh, <coughs> the, door, the door has to be replaced. Um, we actually did uh, put in a capital request to update the windows in the building, but that's that's coming into the next fiscal year. So if I if that <coughs> appropriation is secured, then we will be updating the windows, some of the windows in the building. Uh, you know, going through the typical process with the historic district first, and then uh, updating those windows. Okay, I mean, I'm glad it's uh, that it's an historic building. I think we want to keep the building there. But if we can fit a uh, find a nice use for it in the future, it'd be good. Great, thank you, Ken. David, <coughs> I also agree. This is a, a reasonable use uh, to meet a short term need of town staff, uh, and I also agree with. Jean's comments regarding bike parking and the idling issue. Um, so if, if there is an idling issue, uh, that should be something that DPW can take care of because they're already required to comply with state law. Great, thank you, David. And I, I didn't have any questions either. I, I concur with, with my colleagues. I'm glad that we've found a solution, <laughs> even if it's temporary and um, uh, as, as the halfway point of the lease approaches, it would be great to talk about, you know, how potentially we could position the property in the future. Great. Great. We do have a couple of neighbors. I don't know if they want to ask any questions, so. Great, so at this point, I will open it up for uh, public comment so that if any of the neighbors do wish to speak, um, we would certainly welcome welcome them to do so. So if you if you would like to speak, please use the raise hand 
button uh, under the uh, participants section, and I'd be happy to call on you. All right, uh, so we have uh, uh, Shurish Hirani. Uh, yes, uh, good evening. Um, we live right across from 23 Maple Street. So I just wanted to actually thank Jenny for keeping us posted on um, the events that are taking place at 23 Maple Street and really appreciate her openness in discussing our concerns uh, with what may be coming into that property. Uh, we actually as a neighborhood have discussed uh, prior to this evening's meeting and our real concerns were to do with traffic and idling trucks. Uh, and I'm glad you have uh, made note of that. Uh, I, I will tell you that even though if you say that it's a state law, but somehow DPW at uh, Arlington doesn't like to turn off their trucks. I mean, that's life, I guess. But so hopefully you can address that uh, with them. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you speaking and um, for acknowledging the, the work that uh, Jenny and the department have done to, to work with you. That's great to hear. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, any other uh, neighbors wishing to speak? Okay, seeing none, we will, oh, one more, uh, Max Mahoney. Hi, uh, thank you again for uh, uh, addressing this issue. We've had problems with this property over the last couple of years. And uh, I'm glad to see that it's, uh, Jenny's put a lot of effort into kind of the next move and use for this property. One of the things I will point out, in addition to all the safeguards that I think Jenny has kind of talked about, um, is that the last uh, tenant was subject to a lease that was either, it was poorly drafted and it did not really fit the activity that was going on at the, uh, at the property in many, many ways. Um, and I was just hoping that whatever use and, and this proposed use that Jenny and you guys are talking about seems very reasonable under the circumstances, especially because it is a kind of short to intermediate term um, uh, use of the property, uh, that, it, that it is subject to a written lease that the, the board actually get, uh, approves. I think that's an important thing that it just can't be um, uh, an unwritten tenancy at will. I think it should be uh, go through some some bit of rigor in terms of uh, putting a lease in writing, putting a an addendum or an exhibit on it as to what we all expect the use of the property to be in terms of the number of um, uh, parking spaces, the traffic, the hours of use, very simple um, um, fences around kind of the use of the property. Will it be open on Saturdays and Sundays? What the hours are, simple things like that that weren't, weren't really covered in the last lease. So I'm just uh, voicing my concern and expectation that there would be some type of written lease that we could at least all get a look at before this tenancy actually uh, uh, begins, and I'm I'm hoping that you would address that um, either now or offline uh, at your next meeting. Great, thank you, Jenny. Would you like to address the uh, question and comment about the lease? Sure. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a town department, <laughs> so it's a we um, we actually have other town departments in um, like the central school building, as I mentioned without a lease. Um, in this particular case, what I would like to put together is, is sort of a, le a light version of a lease. The, the lease that Max is referring to is our, uh, the model lease that the town uses basically for all properties. So I would need to work with our town council on something that makes sense. And of course that addresses the issues that have been raised. Um, those issues do tend to get addressed through the model lease process, but can of course be better defined um, which I think was missing from the last lease for the last tenant of this property. Um, but I think uh, I'd need to speak with council about what we would actually put together. And typically what happens is you assign me the authority to enter into that lease on behalf of the board. Um, I would be more than happy to, um, to work with uh, Council Heim 
And also, uh, you know, I, I'm just trying to think of the timeline. Um, I can try to do that and come back to the next meeting. And hopefully at some point in between now and then uh, share something with the neighbors to make sure it captures some of the, the issues that have been raised here and also in correspondence emailed to me. Um, would that work just for, from the board's from the board's perspective? Absolutely. I think if we, um, you know, the, I think the discussion was great tonight. And if if the next step forward would be to authorize um, you and the town to move forward with executing the lease at the next meeting, that that sounds like, like a good next step. Uh, any other comments or thoughts on that as a next step from any of the board members? Looks like we have agreement. Okay. Great. Great. Thank All you. Right. And, and thank you, Shell and Max for speaking. Great. And on behalf of the board, thank you, Jenny. It sounds like you've done a lot of work um, with the with the neighbors and keeping them informed and looking at every which way to, to try and position this property. So thank you for all of that, that, um, that work to get to this point. We're very lucky to have very nice neighbors on Maple Street and, and Academy as well. Great. Very lucky. All right, so that will close uh, item two on our agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, the next item is- There was actually, there, there is actually one, one other piece, sorry. I Rachel. apologize, you're right. No, there's that's okay. Items it's, there. The central school I'll, renovation. I'll be super brief. It's just that this, the renovation is still in progress. It's, we're actually now starting to do the ground and first floor rough, uh, sort of rough carpentry work and things are really starting to come together. Um, various, uh, you know, <laughs> Things are really moving forward. The second floor is now occupied with health and human services. Um, and I was just, I want to put out there that I'm happy to, if the board, if individual board members would like to have their own tour with um, somebody from the construction crew um, to see what's going on over there, uh, you know, wouldn't obviously not as a group, not there's no gathering of people, but if you are interested in learning more or seeing more details, um, you can get in touch with me and I'd be happy to arrange something. If you're not comfortable going there, I'd be happy to do like walk through with my, with, you know, on video or, or whatever would be, you know, helpful. I have a lot of photos of the project, uh, basically keeping the permanent town building committee posted uh, regularly uh, or, um, owner's project manager, the OPM, attends those meetings uh, to provide updates on our behalf as well as get approvals of, you know, requisitions and change orders and all that stuff. But um, so a lot of a lot of correspondence has been, uh, been communicated to that committee, but I want to make sure that the board, um, if there's any interest in seeing what's going on, has the opportunity to do that. So if you're interested, just please let me know. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Kim? Um, are we on uh, on schedule on budget? Yes. That's all well, I need to know. That's yes. all I need to know. I Good mean, job. You know, on, yeah. on schedule with the exception of COVID, which delayed the beginning of the project. So we're behind in that way. But ever since we started the project, now we're on schedule. Yeah, the three months is delays. Yeah. Yes, but good job. We have a thank you, but we have an excellent OPM, and actually we have a really great contractor, uh, Cronenberger and Sons, great. Um, as well as an architect who's doing. They're all doing great work. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I met them before. They they seem really good. Yeah, and and I will not. Uh, I want to make sure I mention facilities has been really critical to making this all work uh, the be in the best way for the town and for the building uh, that has you know a lot of need for up had a lot of need for updates so it's great that they've been very engaged great thank you uh david or gene any questions no this is a not sort of a tangential question a couple of years ago i think we voted to change the name to the community center or something like that but people still call it the central school and some people still call it the senior center um, is that ever going to change or is it going to be? The, uh, the, yeah, I mean, the, the 
Health and Human Services calls it the community center as do the, the Council on Aging. And I think that for the purposes of signage at the building, it will reflect the community center, but we have other building tenants there who also require signage. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're trying to honor that with a sign that says what the building is, but then makes it clear the other tenants that are located there. Um, and to that point, we actually currently have two, they were supposed to be temporary signs that have been there probably for about two years now for the Arlington Center for the Arts that also will be, uh, will need to change. And um, for that, I've been working with the Historic Districts Commission actually on this approval process. But if we have to install another sign more permanently, um, I would actually need to come back to the board. So I haven't, we haven't gotten there yet, but um, yes, the name of the building. I mean, I think, I don't know what to, <laughs> I don't know what to do about the, the history of what people prefer to call it or <laughs> like to call it. Yeah, I think some so, signage when the building is done would probably be helpful. Yeah, I there will definitely be a sign. Yeah. Not the old sign, a new sign. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Jean. David, did you have any questions? Nope. Okay. Anything else on agenda item number two, Jenny? All right. So now I'll move us on <laughs> to agenda item number three, which is the review and approval of the meeting minutes from the October 28th, 2020 uh, meeting. So I will start with Eugene and we'll run through and see if there are any additions or corrections. Um, yeah, I have two, give me a second here because I had it up on my screen but it disappeared for a second. Um, I have two on the first page of the minutes, the second paragraph about the one, two, three. I think the name of the firm is Weston and Sampson, not Westford. Somebody might check on that. On page three, the, the, lar the large paragraph near the end, just before Mr. Lau um, um, said that starts the chair asked the board, the last word of that first sentence should be worded instead of worked. Do you see that? says the chair asked the board to review and comment on the article starting with article 16. Mr. Watson said he's not supportive of this article as it worked. That word should be worded. I just changed it. Yeah. So those are my those are just my two comments. I guess, yeah, I guess I'll just say, you know, I know COVID has sort of slowed everything down. It's hard to remember October board meetings in February. Or the details. No, we're a little behind <laughs> for meeting minutes. Apologies. Uh, Ken, any uh, additions, corrections? Yeah, on page four, uh, near the middle. <clears throat> um, was there Mr. L uh, Law there, or was that me? Isn't that an alternative spelling? Uh, no. <laughs> Anything else, Ken? Uh, I thought I had one. Nope, that's it. Great. Uh, David? Yes, I had a few corrections. Uh, back on page three, where Jean made a change. OK, so the sentence after the one uh, it, it should read, uh, Mr. Watson said the term quotation open space, close quote. Quotation open, yeah, open space. Um, is used as a term of art. Uh, and many other, and we would be using it, oh, we would be using different terminology. So delete it as. Okay, that's that one. Um, on page 
five at the top. Uh, Mr. Watson said there is a larger conversation that sentence. Um, and I think starting with uh, where it says affordable housing account, starting with the word account, delete to the end of the parentheses, including the word account. Uh, and that process is ongoing. Uh, then the next sentence, uh, Mr. Watson said that if the ARB makes substantial changes to the article, I guess it could be vote, but I, I think I was talking about the language specifically. Um, and then in the next paragraph. Can we just not leave that paragraph because one word needs to be changed in the second line. I think you need to take out and second lines with regarding affordable housing. That, that. Oh yeah, you're right. Regarding and yeah, and affordable housing, get, get rid of and, you're right. Um, and in the next paragraph, uh, in the middle, where it says Mr. Watson said that he supports the idea of ADUs, um, but his concern is that if ADUs and then add as broadly defined by this proposal. And then one more, um, a little bit further down in that paragraph, uh, Mr. Watson said that his concern uh, just delete the words that his concern. That's it. Great, thank you, David. The only uh, change I had was actually on page one in the second paragraph. Um, Roughly the, the sixth line where it says Mr. at the end of the, um, on the far right hand side, that should be Miss, Ms. Ray. Anything else? All right, do we see, uh, do we have a motion to approve the meeting minutes as amended? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, we'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. And I am yes as well. The meeting minutes are approved as amended. And that brings us, uh, that closes agenda item number three and brings us to agenda item number four, which is open forum. Uh, this is where any member of the public wishing to speak um, on any topic to the Redevelopment Board is welcome to do so. If you would like to speak, please use the raise hand function under participants, and I will call on you in the order in which hands are raised. You will have three minutes. Please remember to introduce yourself with your first and last name and address. Uh, the first person will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. I would like to bring to your attention some information regarding the William Clark House, otherwise known as 400 Mass Ave. At a previous special permit hearing, I pointed out that the applicant was claiming that the two existing apartments were each single bedroom. That is not correct. They are each two bedrooms, and you can just check the assessor's card for this property. It wasn't a big deal at the time. It simply affected the parking calculation. But it did trigger a memory. A former president of the Historical Society, Ron Shorn, lived in one of those apartments about 30 years ago. My wife and I were friends with Ron and Marcy, and we visited their second floor apartment at 400 Mass Ave. There was no circular staircase in their living room back then. There was no expansion up to the third floor. 
It was just a simple one bedroom apartment only on the second floor. <clears throat> I researched the records and found out that what exists today far exceeds what the zoning board has specified in a special permit in 1980. Roof dormers were, have been added on in front. The roof has been raised in the rear and skylights added. Both apartments have been expanded into this new third floor space. The ZBA special permit approved a plan with a floor area ratio of 0.72 within the bylaw limit of 0.75. The building as it stands today has a floor area ratio of 1.16, exceeding what is allowed under the bylaw by 50%. This EBA never gave permission for this excessive expansion. This redevelopment board hasn't given its permission and remarkably, there were no building permits issued for this work during that period. Bylaws and special permits are not just voluntary suggestions, they are meant to be complied with. It would seem that the applicant has some explaining to do to this board, the ZBA, and to the building inspector. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. Can I ask Mr. Seltzer a question? Please, Jean. Are you reporting this to the building inspector whose job it is to enforce? I have just pulled together this information in the last few days and I expect to be writing to both the building inspector and the ZBA since they are the ones who issued the original um, special permit um, that applies or will apply in, if and when the uh, redevelopment board issues its special permit instead. I'm not sure who has more jurisdiction here. I think all three of you probably do. Thank you. Certainly. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak this evening? Seeing none, we will close the open forum. Uh, any other items from the board before we adjourn the meeting? Ken. I had asked at the last meeting that uh, <clears throat> if we can give me an update of um, some of the projects we approved over the last couple of years and where the status of that is, um, can we get that put into the agenda for the next meeting or the following meeting or whenever there's space? Yeah, that, that was the uh, that was asked to be put on the agenda for the 22nd, so it will be on that agenda. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I didn't know yeah. what one it was and I wasn't sure. Not a problem. Thank yes. you, Jenny. You're welcome. Right. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you, Ken. Uh, any other items from the from the board? All right. Uh, seeing none, do we have a motion to adjourn this evening? So motion. Second. Any discussion? All right. We'll take a roll call vote. Ken. Yes. David. Yes. Jean. Yes. And I am a yes as well. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Good night, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Good, Good night. night. Good night. Good night.